Hello, I am Dr. Beth Bowman, uh, and this is Trauma-Informed Yoga with Sex Trafficking Survivors. So in this training, we will be going through the intervention of trauma-informed yoga, which is an expressive therapy. Um, it's sort of a somatic, so body-focused therapy to address trauma as an intervention with sex trafficking survivors. This is a, applicable to other vulnerable populations and people with um, other types of trauma, uh, but sex trafficking survivors are the group that I uh, traditionally work with, um, and I am a survivor myself. So I'll be going through um, the ins and outs of trauma-informed intervention um, and yoga as an intervention. Um, it's important to note that for a training like this, uh, the folks that will be applying uh, trauma-informed yoga should be licensed clinicians to manage the trauma piece um, and registered yoga teachers because you know folks using yoga uh, can get physically injured and you really need to know um, the anatomy and, and how to do uh, modifications and, and so forth uh, to make it safe for everybody. So who am I? Um, I am uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bowman. Um, I am a faculty member and assist, assistant professor at Gallaudet University. Um, I teach in the MSW program, uh, so Masters of Social Work Students, um, and I have a, an MSW from Gallaudet and then my PhD also in social work. Uh, I worked in DC Child Welfare for about a decade uh, after graduating from my MSW program. Um, and then went into academia. Uh, I have a clinical practice uh, where I work with children and adolescents with um, varying adjustment and anxiety sorts of things. Um, and I specialize in trauma-informed interventions uh, with folks who need sort of somatic work. So um, trauma-informed yoga, breath work, that sort of thing. I am a survivor of domestic minor sex trafficking here in the States. Um, as a 13 to 20 year old person. Um, and yoga was one of the things that really helped me feel safe and connected in my body, uh, which is part of why I believe in it as a really great somatic intervention. Um, a lot of this model is based around the work um, of Bessel van der Kolk and the body keeps the score stuff. So um, it's, uh, definitely worth a read if you are interested in learning more about how to use somatic practices to treat trauma. I am a registered yoga teacher. Um, I got registered when I was a supervisor in child welfare, really with the goal um, of addressing burnout in my child welfare staff. And so I would teach yoga to my staff. Um, and over time, that sort of evolved into uh, focusing on not just vicarious trauma, but, um, but direct trauma treatment. A lot of my research is in the areas of child welfare and human trafficking, um, the intersections of those two, and then also uh, deaf populations as well. So what is trauma-informed care? Um, so trauma-informed doesn't necessarily mean that you're directly treating trauma, but, but the importance um, of being trauma-informed as a clinician um, and as a yoga teacher as well is that you're, you're taking into account that a lot of people have experienced trauma um, and that there's multiple different ways of addressing that trauma um, and the way that it comes up in your body. The other piece of that um, is not just knowing, oh, people have trauma, but what does trauma look like? How do you identify the symptoms um, in your patients uh, and, and if you're a supervisor in your staff? And um, integrating that trauma awareness into not just the interventions that you use, but everyday interactions with staff members and um, policies that you have in, in your organization um, that may look like being more transparent um, and, and open um, because folks who have experienced uh, significant trauma may feel unsteady and, um, and, and concerned about relational dynamics and so forth. And so um, being aware of how to reduce re-traumatization, right? 
in your interactions with your staff or your clients um, is, is really critical to being trauma-informed. Um, I, I posted this little mini uh, YouTube clip about The Body Keeps the Score. Um, in case you haven't read the book, this, this YouTube video is, is a nice resource for um, just an overview uh, of, of what Bessel van der Kolk's work is about um, sort of the somatic implications of trauma and, and how we can access trauma uh, through movement and breath um, and a number of different bottom-up approaches, uh, which essentially work to calm the body down rather than talking about the incidents of trauma and talking about, um, you know, this thing happened to me and so let me, you know, talk it through. Um, we found particularly earlier on in a person's trauma recovery, the bottom-up approaches are, are oftentimes the way to go. Um, this means that um, you're addressing more the symptoms of the trauma and the experience in the body of the trauma. So um, elevated heart rate, panic attacks, um, the sort of re-experiencing and, and those sorts of things, the dissociation. Uh, one of the things as a survivor that was um, a, a big part of, of why yoga was so healing to me was that I was able to focus on, oh, my hamstring or focus on, um, you know, certain things would, would activate me and I would feel really uncomfortable and really angry and really I would have these big emotional responses um, and then I would breathe through them and, and come out of them. And, and sometimes I would get so activated, I would have to leave the class early on. Um, had I had a clinician who was aware that I was being triggered by those physical discomfort um, experiences, they may have been able to walk me through that. So some of what we'll go through in this class is when you have somebody who gets activated by the physical postures of the yoga, which happens, what do you do about it? And, and how do you support them in that? The so trauma-informed yoga, um, and we'll, we'll go through these as we do sort of a sample class, um, but the elements of trauma-informed yoga um, are pretty specific. So they're different than regular yoga, right? Um, one thing that I found interesting since uh, the pandemic yoga rules where you're not allowed to touch people and you're not allowed to do these um, physical adjustments. If you've ever been to a yoga class and had a teacher um, put their hand on your lower back to press you further into down dog or, um, you know, adjust you, right? We call those hands-on assists in, in yoga teaching. Um, in trauma-informed yoga, you do not touch anybody. Um, it's really important that the person has this autonomy um, and the mat is their safe space. And so you want to say that at the beginning of the class that you're really emphasizing that this is their safe space. Um, while you're using the yoga postures, it's their experience, right? It is their class. Um, and so really emphasizing that through the language that you use during the class, rather than saying, um, you know, we're going to do X pose, you'll say when you're ready to move, or um, I would invite you to do X, right? And, and so using language that's more um, creating of self-determination for the student and, and less for the client and less uh, directive. And again, hands-on adjustments um, should, should really not uh, be a, a portion of this. Um, you can, uh, you may have folks that ask you to do a hands-on adjustment, right? And that in that case, they're like, oh, I'm having trouble holding such and such a pose. Can you, um, you just want to make sure that you ask before you touch anybody, um, which is typical of a yoga class, but, but in trauma-informed yoga, that's really, we don't emphasize touch. Um, another thing is there is no wrong way to do yoga. Uh, I, I would say that that's probably typical um, yoga class talk, right? But the in a trauma-informed yoga group, what we're doing here is therapy. So the point is not necessarily the physical pose. If they don't do the pose right and they're having, like they're happy in the pose that they're in or 
um, somebody is uh, has decided to just be in a child's pose for the whole time, that's totally fine. It's a lot more about the internal experience. Um, and your role is to guide them um, to focus on their body, to focus on um, their breath, and, and to kind of calm their mind down as, as stuff is coming up. Um, the comment informed yoga groups uh, ideally should always have about a 30 minute yoga part and a 30 minute group processing part. So um, you can either call it you know, just the group therapy or you can call it a debrief, or however you want to term it. The idea is that if stuff comes up, and if you have a whole bunch of complex trauma, um, the odds of something coming up during the yoga practice is pretty high. So you want to make sure that there's space for that processing at the end of the moving part. So you guide people through a full yoga practice of about 30 minutes, which I would say with anybody that's new to yoga, that's a pretty lengthy practice. Um, and then you have that time where you're really going through um, what came up from them. And you have some guided group therapy questions that you can use to process through whatever it is that the theme is of that day, um, but also creating space for them to just share what's come up for them um, through the movement. Uh, the, so, and I, I have here, the verbal processing is such an important part of any somatic intervention. So you're, you have this, the physical element and then you as the guide of the group, right, are able to allow them space to kind of explore what it was that they were feeling through talking it through. Um, and it may not be about the traumatic experience itself, or it may be, that is completely up to them, but you're creating the space to say, oh, if you were feeling this, um, I wonder why, I wonder, I wonder what that brings up for you. Why are you um, you know, you were feeling really angry when you ran down with dog. What, what does that remind you of? What is it that um, that's going through your head when you're when you're feeling that way? So again, really important to be a licensed professional to to be able to do the trauma processing piece of this. Um, so focus on safety uh, and restoring control. So we have the combination of making sure we have physical safety. Right, we have injuries. We have um, physical conditions, folks should be cleared by a medical provider before they're doing any kind of new exercise, which this is um, a definition of type of exercise, but, um, but also, you know, the safe space on the mat piece, um, reducing uh, arousal through breath work, um, through awareness of the sensation of the physical body. So if somebody's getting really frustrated in a pose, you can, you can redirect them back to their breath, redirect them back to, um, you know, what is this pose creating for you in your body and really focusing on that physical experience um, to decrease the uh, trauma trigger and, and the re-experiencing. Um, and then, so with trauma-informed invention, uh, interventions. It's important that there's, it's really empowerment focused. So as I said, autonomy, self-determination, um, you can always use the terms um, as you're ready, right? We, we are not forcing anybody to do anything that they're not ready for. Um, we're not asking anybody to talk about stuff that they're not ready for in the debrief. Um, and so using those terms as you're ready in a way that feels safe over and over again throughout this practice, because you're trying to re-emphasize um, you're empowered, this is your space, and you are safe, um, and you're in charge of that safety in this moment. But I'm here to facilitate that and to make sure that that continues to be true as we move through this process together. So we can benefit from trauma informed yoga. Probably anybody can. Um, I think that it's fantastic and, um, and I love it. Uh, obviously I'm sitting here talking to you guys about it. But um, so, you know, I started using a similar model for working with um, my staff who had vicarious trauma um, and reducing burnout um, in child welfare social workers. Um, but really anybody with 
trauma histories can benefit from trauma-informed yoga. Um, the sex trafficking population is, is the one that I um, typically specialize in, but I will say um, I've, I've taught this with domestic violence um, survivors, and I, I would say that you know any kind of history of violence and trauma um, is often stored in the body. So this as a somatic practice to really be able to access that and give them agency back over their body and power back over their body is, is what this is aiming to do. Um, so as I said, groups should be guided by somebody who's a registered yoga teacher. Um, you wanna understand the anatomy. You wanna help people not to get injured, right? Um, and you need to be able to do modifications if somebody uh, has a physical condition, that sort of thing, so that you can support them through that practice. Um, and then you also want to have a license for clinical work to be able to manage the trauma stuff that comes up, right? So the group therapy part, um, potential for emotional crisis, those kinds of things you need to be um, a professional that's able to handle those, those things um, in a, a chemically appropriate way. The objectives for trauma and one yoga are a reduction in the symptoms that are associated with trauma. Um, so you've experienced trauma, and with that comes um, an array of symptoms, whether it's complex trauma or just one traumatic experience. Folks um, can have dissociation, they can have re-experiencing, they can have panic attacks, there's you know, low mood and anxiety, and, and all whole host of sleep disturbance, a whole host of all of experience, um, symptom experiences from that trauma. Um, and the idea is that we're reducing um, those physical symptoms through this practice. Building coping skills and improving a sense of empowerment, validation of one's traumatic experience through the group process. Obviously, uh, if we are meeting as a group and we run the therapy group, we will have um, some of other people in the group who have had a similar experience. And, and so having folks that are members of um, similar populations, they will have experienced, uh, they'll be able to validate sort of, oh yeah, you're going through this, I've been through that, or oh, I understand that you're going through this, right? So if somebody has a emotional crisis during, um, during the group, you, you have that cohesiveness in, in the group process. Um, and then obviously an increased sense of, of overall well-being and, and mental stability. Um, so with coping skills, you know, there's a lot of different types of coping skills. I will say using yoga and breath work and body awareness, um, grounded techniques, all of that that's kind of inherent in yoga, um, gives you a number of different coping skills that, um, that you can use and, um, and that can be applied when somebody's not in the Right, and so that's that's part of what we're, we're teaching here. So there's a there's a touch of psychoeducation. Yeah, sex trafficking survivors uh, typically have um, complex PTSD, uh, which is uh, similar to um, PTSD, but there's there's usually additional layers to it. Um, I will say for myself. Um, so have you know, nightmares and avoidance behaviors and um, triggers and so forth. But, um, but yoga really has, has helped me a lot with um, the symptoms of complex trauma. So um, when I'm in a panic attack about you know, things that I have an awareness of how to call my body back, um, you know, and just kind of bring this up sort of back to the place where I feel safe and I'm okay. um, And the sort of dissociation piece, which not necessarily to the point that I'm going to have dissociative identity disorder level, but I'm not certain potential, but, um, but this um, dissociative piece is, is really typical because when you are um, you know, repeatedly traumatized, um, and, and you start to rule that this is just sort of how it's going to be. You, you have to develop a way of separating yourself from what's happening to you in order to um, make it to the other side of, of, of the survival mechanism. And so, um, kind of 
reintegrating back into the body and, and not allowing yourself to compartmentalize when you're really triggered um, is, is a part of what I think you're looking at and help because it keeps you grounded and it keeps you connected to your body and a reminder in that process that you're safe from your body and that you're okay in your body. Okay, so practicing the yoga. Uh, so the yoga is the intervention, right? And so we're using this as sort of a way to access some of what's going on in the body of the person, uh, of, of the client group. So we go through this. So the, the steps to setting up a class for this, and you want to really make sure that you've kind of built out a curriculum for your yoga class. Um, the first thing to do is to set an intention. So this is um, essentially be a mantra, right? I am good. I am loved. I am safe. Um, or it could be a focus area or a theme, balance and stability, connecting to my breath, right? Um, but the idea is that it should go with sort of the, the, the flow of the practice. So if you're talking about balance, right, you may do more balance poses. If you're talking about safety and security, you may do more um, like connection to the earth and grounding stuff. But the, the idea is that as you are guiding through the poses, you can bring them back to that message and that theme really easy and seamlessly because you've already set sort of this is the theme of this class. Um, and ultimately that may guide also what you set for your group therapy questions and, um, and guiding areas of, of discussion for when you get to that portion of, of the class. Interoceptive language. Um, so this is sort of... Um, words that talk about your senses, right? So um, you want to use words like, do you notice, um, feel your feet in the ground, um, sense your breath going in and out of your body, right? Like you're, you're thinking of the senses. Um, and so it's, it's essentially a grounding technique. Um, but as you're teaching a yoga class, you want to use a lot of that language, um, particularly for trauma-informed stuff, because the, the point um, of this class is awareness of the body and awareness of that person's experience. Um, one really great thing that you can always bring people back to for um, if you are struggling for, oh, what do I tell them to, to focus on, right? The breath. Breath is a great one. Um, breath is the connection of your um, body and movement, right? And you can move with the breath. So you're moving in a posture, inhaling in this way and then exhaling out that way, right? And that keeps the person's mind focusing on something physical rather than whatever it is that's going through their head. Um, the idea is we're trying to kind of calm the thoughts and bring the attention to the senses and to the physical sensations. Um, so again, there are some examples here. Notice the ground beneath your feet. Feel the stability of your back on the mat. Smell the lavender or whatever oil that you may, may use, right? Like for a meditation part or for shavasana. Um, so that you can keep people focusing on those different sensations and less on um, you know, any kind of, of thoughts that may arise during the practice. So a breathwork activity um, is usually something that we do uh, kind of at the beginning and the end of class. There's a couple of different practices that you can use, but you'll guide your class through this. Um, maybe alternate nostril breathing. So that's we close one nostril, inhale through one side, then close the other nostril, hold, and then exhale through the other side. And then inhale, close and hold and so on and so forth, right? So we're doing one side at a time and holding in between. Um, so letting in, letting out, hold, letting in, letting out, hold, right? Um, so the idea is that you're really, again, focusing on your breath, oxygenating the body, um, but it, it really does activate that calming of the mind and calming of the body, um, through the practice of, of focusing on what you're doing and focusing on your breath. So the reason alternate nostril breathing is a good one is because you have to, you know, focus on everything that you're doing with uh, what your fingers are and um, which nostril you're doing and, you know, all of that. It, it um, calls the attention to, to the practice itself. Same can be true for 
putting your hands and, and trying to really inhale your diaphragm out um, and then exhale it as tight as you can, right? And, and um, often that'll be done on your back or, or sitting at the beginning of a class um, or at the end of a class during Shavasana. Uh, six, seven, eight breathing or four, five, six breathing, wherever you wanna do it, is inhaling for six, holding for seven, exhaling for eight. And then you do five or 10 cycles of that to really calm down and, and get into the practice. So again, this can, this can be used at the beginning of practice or at the end or both. The movement and the postures of yoga um, are sort of the next thing for building your class. So you've set an intention theme, you've picked a breath exercise to start your class, maybe also to end your class. What are you going to do in between? So with trauma-informed yoga, what we're doing is a gentle yoga practice. We are not aiming to be acrobats here. The point, again, is not getting the postures just right. It's not doing a perfect headstand. It is um, getting awareness and connection to the body. My body is safe. I am in my body, right? That is the message that we are, we are trying to send over and over and over again. And so... Um, you want to aim for a practice that tends towards the easier side. That said, um, you also don't want to have somebody sitting on the floor for long periods of time or laying on the floor for long periods of time because, again, with trauma-informed yoga, we're trying to get people aware of their bodies and not just stewing in their own thoughts. Movement is good. Um, standing tends to be easier uh, than sitting. For most people, sitting on the floor is, is um, it can be challenging to, to do that. So kind of keeping that in mind as you're picking class uh, or picking poses for your class. Um, and moving is easier than, than being still for, for folks with trauma. Um, I will say in my early days of doing yoga, I, I could not do any yin yoga classes, yoga nidra, nothing like that. Like it was move as fast and as hard and as intensely as I could for the whole practice. Um, so that was, uh, and, and, and that was something that, that really helped me, but I will say that over time, as I was familiar with yoga, I eased into more and more gentle practices where I was focusing on my body and my breath because I was getting more and more comfortable being in those poses and in my body in those poses. So you want to have this balance between effort and ease, which means we are, you know, doing a hard pose and then we rest. Do a hard pose and we rest. And maybe not really hard, right? Like we said, gentle yoga. But if you're doing something like downward facing dog or a forward fold, um, particularly for folks who've never done yoga before, those can be challenging. So, um, so you may do a forward fold and then come up to stand and you stand in mountain foot. Well, right. So you want to, you want to have this balance of like kind of going into something and pushing a little bit and then coming back. A bit. And, um, think about really guiding focus on the body, focus on the breath, um, as you're guiding through these postures. Uh, there are modifications for pretty much every pose, uh, that folks can do. And, um, again, this is something that's a good idea to know as a yoga teacher, how to do that. Um, because you're going to have different people with different stuff that they've been through. Um, chair yoga is always a, a good one uh, for folks with a lot of injuries, um, unless for some reason they can't sit in a chair, right? So there's um, it, it varies from person to person. Uh, so having a good solid understanding of anatomy and, and yoga practice is a good place to start. Here's kind of the, the scaffolding, right? So we have build an intention. So we pick finding balance, right? And then we align the posture with the theme. Balance postures um, using our interoceptive language, right? We're moving the body while we talk about quieting the mind. We talk about moving with the breath. Inhale to stand, exhale to fold, and so forth, and forth right? Like we're, we're really talking through um, a lot of what's going on through this practice. There's not a lot of time in a trauma-informed yoga class where you're just sitting and allowing the clients to be quiet with their thoughts. The point of this is you are a guide to keep them safe and in the body. And then the debrief session 
Um, you always want to start open-ended, right? Allow them to express anything that, that might have come up for them. How did the practice make you feel? Were there any uncomfortable feelings that came up during the practice? And then you can jump into whatever guided questions that you have, unless, you know, sometimes the group dynamic kind of takes over and, um, and you uh, go on this, you know, whatever the, the topic that the group is, is wanting to discuss that week. So, um, but the movement is kind of a, an icebreaker effect, right? So it, it helps folks to already be in it with you. Like the group process has developed a little bit through just being in a yoga class together. Um, and so it often does feel a little bit more seamless than um, sitting in a, you know, in a group therapy where everybody is, is just starting talking. When you're starting with the movement, it, it opens up that space to connect. Um, so I'm gonna go through a sample class plan. Um, and I, Obviously, you can't see my whole body, so, um, so I'm not going to demonstrate the poses, but I have uh, posted little pictures of each pose, um, and you know, I'll, I'll guide you through a little bit what those are. So, um, so the intention that we've set for our sample class is safety in your body uh, or feeling support, right? You could pick, pick either one of these, and then you're just bringing them back to that intention as you guide them through this flow. Seated mountain is um, just what it sounds like. It's just a seated, easy pose. Now this guy here with his, his arms up uh, is in full lotus. Um, so he is doing a complicated version of, of seated mountain, but, um, but they can just sit to crisscross applesauce, right? Just sitting on the floor however they're comfortable. Um, and then from here, this is where you'll do your breath work activity, right? So you'll have to close your eyes, do whatever breathing activity that you have guided. You know, say what the intention is. It's important to say to in this class, we're going to really focus on being safe in our body. Setting an intention. Maybe it's feeling safe in your body throughout this class. Reminding yourself of that when you're feeling disconnected, when you're feeling your mind wander, bringing it back to your breath. Into your intention, being you know, safe in my body, right? And then you'll do the breath work together. And then you'll move into a seated sun breath. So essentially what this is, is um, we'll, we'll go through what a sun salutation is, but um, you will sort of fold forward in your seat and then come back up with hands overhead, hands to heart center. So inhale, arms up. Exhale to fold, and then inhale, arms back up, hands to heart center. And you just sort of move through that a few times to get in the groove of moving, um, matching your movements with your breath, um, and really focusing on what you're doing in your body. And then after this, we're already seated in our comfortable, easy pose, do some neck rolls in, in both directions, right? You can do that a few times to kind of get the spine waking up. And then our shoulder circles. So really thinking gentle, waking up the body, connecting with the movement. After this, we'll move into our child's pose. So you see the, the lady that's laying on the floor, her heels and her hips are touching, her arms are stretched out in front of her. That is a child's pose. So we'll start there and then move so that our child's pose is in a twist to one side. Through a few breath cycles there. A breath cycle is inhale and exhale, right? So you inhale, exhale, maybe do that three times, and then walk your fingertips all the way to the other side. Um, and then come back up. And then we'll find our table pose. So the lady in the green yoga outfit is doing a table pose. This is hands and knees. Um, and we'll start here, just sort of gently. Um, maybe arching and, and curling your back back and forth into some cow stretches if that is how you'd like to, to start the class. Um, and then we'll find some leg balance. So the image next to her has the arm and the leg lifted, so opposite arm and opposite leg. Typically for a gentle class, I have them keep their arms on the floor and we'll just lift the leg and then we'll drop that down, maybe go into a child's pose. 
and then do the other side, right? So this is um, this engages the core. It connects the um, sort of what we talked about, about the ease and effort, right? So you've had a little bit of easy movement, sitting. Now we're moving the body. We're engaging some big muscle groups. Um, and then we come back down out of that, finding our side plank. Um, so again, this is uh, a side plank is typically with both feet on the floor and then the body's completely up on one hand. Uh, for a modified side plank, we would do what the lady in the yellow yoga mat is doing here with one knee down and just stretching the arm up towards the sky. Um, so this is stretching out the side body um, and then dropping down into a child's pose to find a little bit of ease, breathing through that, and then coming back up into the other side and, and doing the other side. Um, and again, then taking a moment in your child's pose before you bring them up into a downward facing dog. Anytime you bring your clients into a downward facing dog, you want to give them um, a moment to maybe bicycle out their legs. So you push one hamstring down, one heel down, and then the other. Um, because there tends to be a lot of tightness uh, for folks that haven't done a lot of yoga or if it's just their first time practicing for that day. Um, but again, so, you know, we're talking about balance here. So, so when you're in your side plank, when you're in your um, table pose with your leg balance, you'll be reminding them, you know, we're, we're safe in our body. We're balancing through our body, but, you know, whatever, you, whatever it is you set the um, intention for for that class. Um, and then uh, we'll move into a supported forward fold. So this is where your knees are bent a whole lot. So you walk your feet up to your hands and bend over into a forward fold. And then we'll do some sun salutes. So a sun salutation um, traditionally is it's a sequence that basically heats up the body. Um, I like to use it in a trauma-informed yoga class just to kind of keep us moving, right? So at this point in the class, we've been moving a little bit. This is this is the sequence where you really connect body to breath. So you start um, standing upright, two arms go up overhead, fold forward, plant your hands on the floor, step back to the top of the push-up. Typically, I have people keep their knees on the ground for this. Um, and then you sort of scooch forward into a baby cobra, which uh, the image here has a lady doing an up dog, which means her knees and her hips are up off the floor. Um, but a baby cobra, you actually have everything up to your rib cage on the floor and your elbows are bent. So you're just stretching a little bit into a baby back bend, not um, this, this deep back bend. Um, and then you press back through your downward facing dog or your child's pose. Uh, child's pose is always a modification for downward facing dog and always a nice safe place to just kind of have people chill. You want to mention that, right? You want to say if, if at any point at the beginning of class, if at any point you feel like you need to find a child's pose, go ahead, right? You can catch up with us wherever we are later if, if that feels good to you. Um, and then stepping your feet forward. Uh, all the way to the top of the mat, folding forward, coming back up, arms overhead, and back to stand. Um, and so in these postures, arms overhead is an inhale, folding forward is an exhale. Planting your hands is an inhale, um, going, down, going down through your um, knees, chest, chin, uh, onto the mat is an exhale. Uh, back bend is always an inhale. Downward dog is always an exhale. So, um, so really thinking about that, that, that each movement has a breath associated with it. Um, and so you can guide them through that, or you can have them, you know, you usually do one or two of these together. And then um, if you do it again, and I have it here, so, you know, you would go through it again, um, where, the clients would have an opportunity to go at their own pace, right? So you've taught them how to do it and now they have the opportunity to just move as quickly or as slowly as they like through that full sequence. Um, so standing mountain pose is what the lady on either end of that sequence is doing. It's, um, you can have your hands apart center or you can have your hands down here, but it's literally just standing and really focusing on the feet grounding into the mat. This is a resting pose. 
This is allowing them space to kind of chill after we built some heat with the sun salutation A um, or sun salute A. Um, and then we'll do a tree. So this guy in the little red guy in the picture has his foot all the way up on his inner thigh. Uh, typically with a gentle class, I'll have people keep their toes on the floor. And so their inner, um, the sole of their foot is actually just sort of touching their ankle. Um, it's not all the way up their leg. You never want to have them put it on their knee. So if they can't get it all the way up to their inner thigh, calf or floor um, and ankle is, is the way to go. Um, and so we'll do that on one side and then we'll do it again on the other. Again, focusing on breath. Um, tree is great for a trauma-informed yoga class, I find, because people fall out of it all the time. Like it's it's a balanced pose. It takes a lot of concentration, um, but everybody's giggling. Everybody's, you know, like, oh, look, I can do this or, or oh, no, I, you know, I can't stay up. And people are, are you know, having a good time with the pose, which creates um, some connection in the group dynamic. Um, and then again, going through another sun salute just to kind of flush that out. Um, and then we will close out the class. So after you've um, made it back down to the mat, right? So you're standing at the end of the sun salute, you can have them either go through a down dog and lean back into their child's pose, um, or you can have them just uh, come down into a tabletop from standing and, and push back into the child's pose. Um, and then rolling back over your legs into a seat uh, from there. Um, and then to close out, it's always a good idea to do, I, I like doing happy baby pose um, just because it kind of um, realigns the spine and the hips and, and so forth. Um, but you're kind of bringing folks back down after those um, tougher poses with the child's pose, bringing our breath down, we're on our seat, then we roll to our back, um, and the happy baby is what the guy in red is doing. You can either grab the outsides of the feet and you're pressing, the idea ultimately is to get your knees to the, um, your thighs and your knees to the floor on either side of your torso, um, but most of the time people aren't there. You can always grab behind the thighs if it's too hard to grab your feet, um, but you're opening up, resetting the sacrum, resetting the spine here. Um, and once they've done that, you can squeeze the knees into the chest. Um, I always like to say, invite your knees over your body and give them a nice hug, reminding your, yourself just how safe you are here on, on this mat. Um, and then laying down um, on the mat in, in uh, Shavasana. Um, Shavasana is roughly translated into corpse pose. I don't typically uh, advertise that in a trauma-informed yoga class. We just call it Shavasana. Uh, but we talk about the deep relaxation of this pose. Usually you're in for a 30 minute yoga class, we're talking four or five minutes in Shavasana. Um, and again, you don't want it to be just a completely silent period of time where they're laying on the floor with their eyes closed, right? This is um, folks that may have challenges with being alone with their thoughts. So you really want to guide them through Shavasana, just like you have the rest of the practice. So um, I posted a, a YouTube um, like yoga meditation video here that you can watch for an example, but um, think kind of walking them through progressive muscle relaxation without the squeezing, right? So like just focusing on your foot, really relax your foot. Focusing on your thigh, really relax your thigh. So you're, you're just continuing to talk and continuing to be their guide, even through this quiet moment you keep your voice low and keep everything really zen and calm. Um, you can have music throughout the practice. I try to keep either no music or, or really calm, nature-y kind of music um, so that we stay in, we're not overstimulated when we're in doing this really challenging somatic work. Um, and then when the, when the, uh, Shavasana is done. Everybody comes back up to a seat. And this is where you can do another like breath moment. Usually I do about three guided breaths together to close out the practice. So breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. And we'll do that three times. Close and everybody will open their eyes and just stay on their mat. Um, if they want to sit in a chair, if there's chairs available in the space that you're in, you can do that. Um, but we're really uh, 
we're sitting together in, in this space and we've all just done a yoga class together, right? And so now we're jumping right into the, um, the trauma therapy group piece. Um, so as I said before, sort of the, the mat is the safe space. You want to use invitations rather than commands, emphasis on noticing the body um, and using really body positive language, right? So, so we're not um, talking about what we can't do or, um, if somebody's like, oh, I can't do that pose, be like, well, you know, there's there's modifications to this pose that you can get your body into. And um, what feels good in your body right now? And, and really um, that positive reinforcement of, of what they can do, um, the self, the positive self-talk piece, we, we're trying to, to reinforce that and, and encourage them to um believe that their body is capable and that their body is good and that their body is theirs. So for the group debriefing, um, you want to have guiding questions. Again, you start with wherever everybody's at for the group, um, but you should have stuff that's going to you can use anything that, that you use in your, your normal group clinical practice tailored for um, the, the trauma survivors that you're working with. And so, um, you know, if you already work with sex trafficking survivors, you may have group questions that would easily match up with this. Um, and if you work with other, uh, groups that have experienced trauma, it's, it's sort of the same idea, right? Is, is you tie in whatever it is that you've been trying to connect through that somatic practice, the theme, the intention, and then have that connect with, um, the group process, so it isn't jarring, right? So it feels like it's this cohesive thing that we're all moving through together. We're going through this journey of physical and emotional connection and exploration together, and we are safe and we are validating each other's experiences. Um, so be flexible. The group wants to talk about something else. The group process sort of leads you somewhere else. Um, or you're running a different kind of group than you usually run and, and you need to adjust the topic, um, you need to adjust the postures because you're in a senior center and, and folks are in um, maybe wheelchairs or have physical limitations. If you, you want to be flexible, that's, that's the bottom line for, for these groups. Um, so that is, is really uh, the the whole story about how to how to build a yoga class, a trauma-informed yoga class um, for group therapy. Um, and I wanted to just for a moment um, talk about the method through which I am, am using trauma-informed yoga. So the Restoring ID Collective is my nonprofit that uh, the goal is really to build community of sex trafficking survivors. Um, we do trauma-informed yoga. Um, I am ultimately hoping to, I've, I've been going out to places to do this, but I'm hoping to um, soon open up my home to have this be a community space for drop-in, um, a safe place to land, uh, which is what I like to call it. But um, for yoga groups, for faith-based groups, um, food and, and dinners and sharing with community um, with an emphasis on pregnant and postpartum survivors, which obviously modifications for the yoga stuff. Um, but so I, I, I guess I, I want to emphasize that I think um, any of these somatic practices and any group practice using somatic practices, there's this potential for real deep connections that can happen through that group. Um, and so, you know, that's really our goal uh, at the Restoring Ivy Collective is, is to make sure that people feel like they're a part of something and, and um, connected to other survivors as they're growing and becoming who they're going to be. It's a picture of me and my daughter uh, doing yoga together. Um, and ultimately, we're hoping to do um, a safe house with uh, rooms, but it's TBD for right now, uh, as I have teenagers living in the house. Um, so I'm going to grab my references. Um, let's see. So that is it for the trauma informed yoga class for trafficking survivors. I hope you have learned some things that you can apply, um, some things that are useful for your clinical practice and for the groups that you serve. 
And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and we will connect. Thank you so much.